Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are, as Mark said, continuing our studies in 1 Thessalonians, and this morning we're in chapter 4. I have a brief passage, verses 9 through 12, but a passage that is, uh, I think, very significant. All passages are, of course, but it says very practical direction for our lives. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 9. As to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Now, it's the same phrase that he used in verse 1 of the chapter where he commended them for their walk with the Lord. They were pleasing the Lord. He wasn't correcting them. He says, as you actually do walk. And then he says, excel still more. So that tells us the Christian life is a very progressive life. And we are to continually be excelling in every aspect of it. But he continues, not only to excel in love, but he says, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to tend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In a sermon by Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse that he preached decades ago, Probably in the 1950s, he spoke of one of the great problems that people struggle with. That was in the 1950s, known as the Fabulous 50s. The economy was booming. Eisenhower was president. We weren't at war. And you wonder what kind of problem could people have? And he said, the problem is the dailiness of life. And he quoted a lady who said, life is so daily. It's so ordinary. And it is for most people. We can feel like we're living on a squirrel wheel, just going round and round. Nothing much changes. It's the same thing every day. That's life for most people. That's life for most Christians. So we're tempted to think that the better life, the higher Christian life, is different. It's like that of George Whitfield or... John and Charles Wesley, men who served God to their last breath. And that was literally true of Whitfield, whose preaching sparked the Great Awakening, first in England and then in the American colonies. He preached up and down the eastern seaboard. He was a tireless worker. The last night of his life was in a manse in Newburyport, Massachusetts. He had just finished a preaching tour, he was ill, he was exhausted, and he should have been in bed when a crowd gathered at the door begging to hear the gospel. So they came into the house, he stood at the top of the stairs holding a candle, unaware of the time, and, and preached fervently until the candle flickered and burned itself out, as did his life. His biographer wrote, that like that candle, his life burned brilliant and bright, but burned its last that night, active and faithful to the very end. Now that's a life, well lived, nothing daily about it. Whitfield is one of the spiritual giants in the earth, and men like him challenge us to strive for the Lord even more. But the reality is, life for most of us is not live crossing oceans and continents to preach to thousands in the open fields, then dying, giving a sermon with a candle in hand. Our time in this world is spent in the ordinary. We deal with the routine. We deal with the dailiness of life. And that is as God intended it to be. Living where most people in the world live. And living faithfully in that world daily. And that's no small thing. It's the instruction Paul gave to the Thessalonians and to us. 
here in chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And it's every bit as significant as the life that Whitfield and the Wesleys lived or any other great man such as that. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, come on. My life in the office or the shop or in the classroom is significant? Yes, it is. In God's providence, that's where you live and that's where you have an impact. You have a ministry. Christians live in a fishbowl. People see us doing what they have to do and they notice how we do it. Our lives are sermons lived out. And people experience the benefit that we are to them. Children in the home benefit from the faithfulness of their parents. The example that they set and the, the care their mother and their father give them. It, it, it has a lasting influence on them. It's a, a selfless life. Every bit as pleasing to the Lord as Whitfield's selfless decision to stay and preach one last time rather than take to his sickbed. Uh, that's Paul's instruction to the Thessalonians. It's really simple. Love the brethren, work hard, and live a quiet life. The quiet life is the godly life, a responsible life that brings glory to God and has an influence that is wide. It is... Uh, a short passage that divides into two parts. Verses 9 and 10 are about love for fellow Christians, and verses 11 and 12 are about our influence on non-Christians, on the world. These four verses are instruction on our relationships inside and outside the church and how important those relationships are. The first mark of this life, the normal Christian life, and the virtue that governs that life is love. The Thessalonians were living it. They were characterized by it. That's how Paul begins our passage, verse 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So, Paul wrote to them of love, not because... They needed to be told to practice it or to be instructed in, in what love is, but because they knew what it was and they were practicing it and they were a model of it. The love they practice is literally the Greek word Philadelphia. The love of the brethren or brotherly love. They had a concern for other Christians and they made sacrifices for them. Paul was praising them for that. He's already mentioned it in chapter 1, verse 3, and then again in chapter 3, verse 6. The Thessalonians were characterized by love of the brethren. But in praising them here, he was also giving the glory to God because the reason they were practicing Philadelphia was because they were taught to do this by God. So he didn't need to write them about this because they were, as he said, literally, God taught. Now that's true of all Christians. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, the apostle taught that love is the, the standard that demonstrates that a person has passed out of death into life, that a person is born again. He or she will practice love. In fact, John says, he who does not love abides in death. He's not born again. And then in chapter 4 and verse 19, he said, we love because he first loved us. Now that, that tells us everything we need to know, or not everything we need to know, but tells us a great deal of what we need to know about the Lord God. He takes the initiative, and he always takes the initiative with us. That's grace. We love because he first loved us, but we do love if we're born again. And our love that he speaks of is for God and for others. And it's the result of God's grace. It's the result of being born again. But it is, is cultivated, it's developed in us 
through the Lord's instruction. The Holy Spirit does that in all of us. We're born again with a new nature. And we have within that new nature the seeds of all the virtues of that, that, that characterize the new life. Love being the first one. And those are, are brought to fruition, are brought out by the, the work of the Spirit within us, teaching us. And Paul speaks of, of that here. He speaks of that in other places. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, he speaks of being taught by the Spirit. That's being taught by God. So love, first of all, is a supernatural virtue. It is the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5, verse 22. That's a work of the Spirit of God. It's a supernatural thing, but it's in every one of us because we are supernaturally remade into new creatures. And so this virtue of love is in the believer, and of course it's in the believer from varying degrees, but it's in all of us. And it was characteristic of the Thessalonian church and the early church. The pagans noticed the Christians' love for each other. Tertullian mentioned that in the second century and made a famous quote about that. They observed how these Christians loved each other and how they expressed love for those around them, love outside of the church. That was a characteristic. And all of us are responsible to behave in this way. This is a characteristic of the Christian. The Thessalonians did. It was a work of God, but still, the fact that they showed such love and concern for others is a remarkable thing. Because remember, they were a very young church when Paul wrote these letters. They couldn't have been a church for more than a few months. But Paul says in verse 10 that they had responded well to the Lord's instruction to them on this and responded broadly. They practice love toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. And Macedonia, as you know, is in northern Greece. It's the northern half of Greece, and the Thessalonians were there in Macedonia, as were the cities of Philippi and Berea. All of the churches from Philippi to, Thess to Thessalonica to Berea were established on Paul's second missionary journey. So they had close relations with those churches, the Thessalonians did, and, and possibly and probably others that are not mentioned. The statement here of all of, the, of Macedonia suggests that there were more churches that they had relations with rather than, than just the church in Philippi and Berea. And we know from, from what Paul later wrote in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2 that these Macedonian churches were very poor. Uh, they would have had men, many needs, especially at this time since they were uh, being persecuted. But the Thessalonians, in spite of all of that, helped with what they had in tangible, sacrificial acts of love. And that characterized them. Quite remarkable, I say, for a very young church, but that's... Was, that was true of them. It characterized all of the poor Macedonian churches, which Paul singled out for praise in uh, 2 Corinthians 8. They gave to the Jewish relief fund that he collected and that he wrote uh, uh, to the uh, Corinthians about, encouraging them, now you've made a commitment, you need to follow through with that, and gave us the great example of that. The Macedonian churches, whom he had not solicited from, they were poor, but they gave liberally. In fact, Paul tried to discourage them from giving since they were so poor, but they begged him to let them give. They wanted to help those poor saints in Jerusalem, and so he finally relented, and they gave joyfully. And that's the kind of giving that God loves, a, a cheerful giver, giving out of gratitude for the grace we have received and from the natural love that God's people have for one another. All of the Macedonian churches were a model of, of giving and love. But it, here it's the Thessalonians that, that Paul praises, especially for that. A very young church, but one well taught in the virtue of love. 
Still having praised them, Paul goes on to exhort them. He urged them, he said, to excel still more, which indicates there's no cap or ceiling on love. Leon Morris wrote that to sit back satisfied with what one has done is to sound the knell, to sound the death knell of effective Christian service. Our love and service is to only increase. Paul has given this instruction three times in a a, a short space. In uh, chapter 3, verse 12, he said, Abound in love for one another. Chapter 4, verse 1, he said, Of their walk, their, their life, their obedience to the Lord, their life that was pleasing to the Lord, he said that they should excel still more. And then here talking about love, their love for the brethren, which he praises, he says, excel still more. That's the Christian life. It's never static. We're never never stationary. We are always progressing if we're living a vital Christian life. Always increasing, growing, and excelling. Now, the reality is there are setbacks in everybody's life. Our hearts grow cold. We have to deal with that. And God deals with it. He doesn't let us remain in that kind of condition. He he deals with us and he revives us and the Spirit of God rekindles affection for him and for one another in our hearts. And and he does that as he teaches us. He's the ultimate teacher. He's the one who opens our heart to receive the truth. He enlightens our minds. And so through the study of his word, and it's always through the study of his word, We are enlightened, and as we are, as we learn, and and we walk in that knowledge, that is, we obey the things that we've learned, we respond to them. As we do that, as we're taught and we respond, we grow. And as we grow, we excel in love, and we excel in effectiveness as a Christian. Now, we may not be George Whitfield or John Wesley and command international celebrity, but, but that's not the point for any of us or for them. And it doesn't last anyway. Celebrity never lasts for very long. So that's not what we're seeking. We will be as pleasing to the Lord and as useful to the Lord as Whitfield or Wesley or anybody else was, even if it's on a smaller scale. That's the point. Abounding more and more in love and obedience and service is the best life. It's the profitable life, the fruitful life, the life that pleases the Lord and is helpful to others. It's the life that has lasting effects and the life that has eternal reward. That's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 6, about storing up treasures in heaven by seeking first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and then everything will be added to you. But seek those things first. Seek to live the life that brings glory to Him and is a blessing to His people. That's the abundant life of John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, It came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. It's this kind of life. That certainly happens doing missionary work on foreign fields and and preaching to thousands, and God uses men like that. But it happens every bit as much here at home in the mundane matters of life. That's where most of life is lived. It happens when we give assistance to those in need, when we see the need and see that we can help, as the Thessalonians did. Maybe it's material assistance that's given, Depends on the need. It may simply be uh, help of sound counsel or encouragement. But it also happens and must include an orderly life, a productive life, a good home life. That's what Paul says next in verse 11 where he advises them to be diligent workers And to make it your ambition, so make it your ambition to excel more in love and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life 
and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Now, some have sensed a problem here in the church, here in verse 11, that there's, have sensed behind these words a particular problem. And it's often identified as a, a failure on the part of the Thessalonians to work due to the excitement and anticipation they had of the Lord's return. And what might give some support to that is the next paragraph in, the chapter, in, in chapter 4 has to do with the, the Lord's return and the rapture of the church. And so the idea is they were so excited about this, they were telling their neighbors and their friends all about the coming of the Lord. And what's the point of working? He's coming. He's coming soon. And that may be, but Paul doesn't say that here. In fact, he doesn't give a reason for the instruction. It could be that he gave this instruction just simply due to his knowledge of human nature. He knew that we all tend to follow the path of least resistance. And if we don't have to work, we won't work. So he's just taking a precautionary note here, or making a precautionary note, a, a, some preventative advice. That may be, or it may be, he's not correcting them at all, but simply giving them instruction that is valuable, giving them important perspective on their daily lives, our daily lives. In fact, I think this is, is so simple, it is profound. Work is worship. Labor is service. Don't, don't measure success in the Christian life by George Whitfield or your favorite theologian or Bible teacher. God gives the church all kinds of gifted people, and they're a great blessing to the church. Some serve on a, a worldwide scale, but they aren't our standard. Now, they're an encouragement. I don't want to take away from that, but they're not our standard. God's Word sets the standard for us. And this is it. This is the Christian life. Faithfulness in the mundane things, in the daily things. And so... Paul tells them to make it their ambition to lead a quiet life. And that's a bit paradoxical because uh, the Greek word ambition literally means to love honor. And that's what the world does. It, it pursues selfish ends. It is ambitious for honor. It's ambitious for glory. Paul said, have that same ambition for an inglorious life, a simple life. A quiet life. And that word quiet life is a good translation. In Luke 14, verse 4, the word is used of the Pharisees and lawyers being silent after Jesus spoke. They didn't have anything to say. They couldn't answer back to him. They were silent. They were quiet. It's also used of, of labor on, on the Sabbath. It's quiet. So what is a quiet life? Well, it's obviously not literally being quiet like Monks who take a vow of silence or are always resting and meditating without working. Work is required. That's, Paul makes that point in the next statement. It is a tranquil life. It's a peaceful life. It's the opposite of a, a talkative, restless life. But still, an active and orderly life that involves the, the home life and the work life. That's really what he's speaking of here. He goes on to urge, attend to your own business and work with your hands. Be a good neighbor and friend. Be productive. Support your family. That's how we attend to our own business. We, we live a responsible life within the home. We're faithful to one another, husbands and wives to each other. Fidelity is fundamental to godliness. We care for each other in the, in the trials and setbacks of life, and marriages have those. But a man doesn't abandon his wife, wife of his youth, and his responsibility when difficulties come. I think a good example of what I'm talking about here is of, of a Christian man doing what he's supposed to do in a difficult situation is found in B.B. Uh, Warfield, Benjamin B. Warfield, who may have been the greatest theologian of the 20th century. He lived theology. Early in his marriage, he and his wife were in Germany. 
uh, may have been their honeymoon. They were walking in the Harz Mountains when they were caught in a terrible thunderstorm. Mrs. Warfield suffered a nervous breakdown and never really recovered from it. It only got progressively worse. So for the rest of her life, War Warfield cared for his invalid wife. While carrying on a, a full load at Princeton Seminary and filling volumes with articles that he wrote. He took her on walks on the Princeton campus and uh, read to her every day. When she became bedridden, he rarely left the house and was never away from her for more than an hour or two at a time. It was said Warfield had two interests in life, his work and Mrs. Warfield. Now that was a quiet life, a life of attending to business in the home, doing what is right for another, being faithful in things unseen by most people, but seen by God and seen by his angels. And the angels are watching. And they're learning from the church. They're watching us now. I assume Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. What they see as they look at us should be the, what the sovereign grace of God does. It changes selfish people into selfless saints. And they should marvel over the changes that they see God producing as well as the great glorious things that he's revealed in his word. Well, that's what the world should see in a Christian home, faithfulness. It's what children should see in the home, in their parents, and, and what they should receive from their parents, protection, provision, and spiritual instruction. That, that's largely how the, the next generation of the church is shaped. It's shaped in the home. And we, aren't, we aren't guaranteed the conversion of our children, but that is very often where conversion occurs. It occurs in a Christian home. So the quiet life, responsible life, in which we attend to our business is, an, is as important as the ministries of the great teachers and evangelists of the church. That's where God does His work. It calls for patience, it calls for vigilance, discipline, perseverance, not only in the home but in public in the workplace. Paul tells Christian men to work, to provide, and be a witness to the world in that way. His instruction that they work with their hands would have been, for many Greeks, a very hard statement for them to accept because manual labor was considered by the Greeks to be slavish and demeaning. Christians took a very different attitude and took the scriptures again as their standard, not the world's ideas, not the world's mores, that the, the Bible is our standard. They took that as their standard, and the Bible teaches the dignity of labor. When God created Adam, he put him in the garden, and he told him to cultivate it and keep it. And that was God's, that was a God-given task. It was honorable and good. It was Adam's way of worshiping the Lord. And, of course, Jesus was a carpenter who worked with his hands. Any kind of honest work is noble and acceptable. God ordained labor before the fall. And so labor's good. And we're to engage in labor, and we're to engage in it with holiness, with righteousness. Work is a ministry. Really, the world is our pulpit, every one of us. The way you work, the way you treat people at work or in everyday life is a ministry. People see it and are affected by it, good or bad. Bad if we're not responding correctly. Laboring in whatever field we work, blue collar or white collar, laying bricks or doing surgery is all legitimate. It's all legitimate labor. And it is a fundamental part of establishing a good society, building a good society. So it's a ministry. 
So we are to be ambitious for that as well. We are to work hard. And when we do, and when we're not idle, we do what Paul has urged. We, we mind our own business. In fact, we really don't have time not to mind our own business if we're busy with the work and the responsibilities at hand. So we don't meddle with other people's business when we're doing the things that Paul has instructed us to do. Again, Paul says... This wasn't new teaching. He and his friends had taught this to the Thessalonians when they were first there. They had taught them a lot about the Bible and doctrine and behavior, living a responsible life, working. Uh, Paul had given them the, the full range of instruction. Uh, maybe some in Thessalonica neglected their responsibilities or were tempted to do that, to be to be careless in the mundane and the routine, but a quiet life, an ordinary life of taking care of the basic responsibilities in life, not interfering with other people's lives, is mature. And it is a very important witness to the world. Paul gives two reasons for work in verse 12. They are so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Again, the world is watching us. How we behave matters. Appearances matter. The church should never modify its uh, convictions to appease the world. Paul's not suggesting that. And he meant... A person should not neglect his or her basic temporal responsibilities in life, such as work. Even the secular, for us, is spiritual. Neglect undermines a person's testimony. One of the best testimonies a person can have is to be honest and diligent, doing the very things Paul commanded here, a quiet life, not a gossip's life, uh, minding our own business, and working. Well, we should be doing that because we are Christ's ambassadors in this world. Being quiet, honest, and reliable on the job shows respect and maturity and may well lead to an opportunity at work to give the gospel. Paul was an example of this. He worked with his hands, making tents. I'm, I'm sure he mastered the craft and produced for people the best product they could buy. I'm sure he had earned a reputation as a great tent maker. He worked at it and worked diligently, conscientiously. He did it, first of all, to the glory of God. Everything we do is to be done to the glory of God. And so he did it with excellence. And secondly, and very importantly, he worked to provide for himself and for others, for those that were with him, so that they would not be a burden on the other people, the people of Thessalonica, the young believers there, or in Corinth, wherever. Now that's the second reason he gives for working, that they not be in any need. We are not to be dependent on others. We are not to be a kind of charity case. Now sometimes... We have to be. That's the providence of God brings that about. And sometimes people are in need, like those saints in Jerusalem that Paul was taking care of. And we need to act to help and to be a blessing. But not when a person is able to work and chooses not to. Chooses instead to live off the, in the industrious brethren. Christians are, are totally dependent on the Lord. And by His grace, we are to live independently of others, self-sustaining, providing for ourselves through hard work. Again, that's the best life. It's the best life for the individual, personally. But the best life is the quiet life. It's the productive life. And we don't have to be a Billy Graham to make a significant mark on society to God's glory. A useful, beneficial life, a life of love, of helping others, and a family life is a glorious witness to the world that the world doesn't experience for itself generally because it doesn't know peace and it doesn't know contentment. 
When we do what we're supposed to do, and we do what Paul is saying here, we're putting our theology into practice. When the Puritans were leaving England on the Arabella to establish a colony in Massachusetts, John Winthrop preached a sermon on the deck in which he made his famous statement, we shall be a city on a hill. Then he said, the eyes of all people are upon us. And the eyes of all people are upon us. Our works as well as our words are a sermon. So may we live well for the Lord. And again, the eyes of the Lord are on us. He knows what we do. And he's pleased with the quiet life. When we go about our business loving the brethren and dealing honestly with the world. That's the Christian life. Not lots of noise and action. There's lots of good noise and good action. But, but the basic Christian life is this. It's living an orderly, productive life. An honest life. And that begins in the heart. I said that the world is our pulpit. Well, the heart is our battlefield. That's where the desires and motives are. That's where the, the, the decisions of life are essentially made. That's, that's where love is, and that's what the Lord counts as important. Man looks at the outward appearance, God told Samuel, but the Lord looks at the heart. And there he sees what is genuine and what is done for him and not for self. There he sees what's really true. And that's what's really important. And George Whitfield knew that. He told his friends, When I am dead, I desire no epitaph other than this. Here lies G.W. What kind of man he was, the great day will discover. You can't tell what kind of man someone is, what kind of woman someone is by the outward. The Lord knows the reality. And that great day will discover greatness we never saw things done in the home where a man took care of his wife, where a mother took care of her children, or where a, the, by faith a person overcame some, some debilitation, some fear that he or she had in order to obey, step out on faith and, and honor the Lord. There are lots of things that, uh, that the right hand does that the left hand knows nothing about. But God does, He knows everything, and He rewards it as He blesses a faithful life lived in the, the mundane and the daily. But may the Lord give us hearts that burn for, for Him and live with joyful obedience in the ordinary, that are, are lived out of love in a, the quiet life. The great day will discover it, and the great day will bring about rewards for it. But it will discover something else as well, who believed and who didn't. So I close with the question, have you believed? Have you believed in Jesus Christ as God's eternal Son, very God of very God, and the only Savior of men? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? If not, come to Him because... You are in desperate need of Him. You are lost and time is short. Eternity is before you. Trust in Him. Trust in His death on the cross for forgiveness where He paid the penalty for all who do trust in Him. He receives all who put their faith in Him. And then by God's grace, live for Him. Pursue that quiet life. Be a witness to those around you. Let's end with one of the great hymns of the faith. Hymn number 104 in the Red Book, Come Thou Fount, Stand, and then Remain Standing for the Benediction. Hymn 104. The Lord, how true it is that we are prone to wander. That's, that's the flesh. That's the sin that remains in us. But you never let us go. 
we can wander a bit, but you bring us back and we can never escape your sovereign hand. And we give you praise and thanks for that. Help us to reflect deeply on that, on your grace, that we would live the kind of life Paul recommends here. That quiet life, which is an orderly life, to your glory and be a witness to those around us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love for us. May we reflect it back to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.